so our take, we're not tackling decentralization, we're, we're tackling privacy, but our take is like, can you build an infrastructure which you, you can keep the privacy, but you can add accountability. And then when you have accountability, you can start making things safe because you can you know, punish people who do fraud, punish people who do hacks, you know, punish malicious users. And, and if you have this kind of like safety in place, you know, people might be more willing to, you know, yeah, like put a larger part of their like financial assets on chain, interact more on chain, all of this. Hey everybody, Tanner here with Wagney Ventures. On today's episode, we have Salon Afota, co-founder of Notebook Labs. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagney Ventures podcast where we do snapshots with interesting founders from across Web3. Check out wagneyventures.io to learn more about the syndicate behind the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Salal from Notebook Labs. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm here with Salal Afota, co-founder of Notebook Labs. Uh, co- Salal, how's it going today? It's going great. Yeah. Thanks, Tana, for having me on the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to chat. I know we've got a ton to talk about here and uh, the work you guys are doing is really, really cool. So I'm excited to get to share it with our audience. Um, maybe to start, it could be helpful just to learn a little bit more about you and kind of what brought you to building Notebook. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a student at Stanford. Um, before coming here, I, I did a lot of math and kind of was interested a lot in bl- blockchain infrastructure and you know, sort of cryptography. And, and when I came to Stanford, I got even more into cryptography and I, I learned about, you know, the fascinating world of like zero knowledge proofs. And um, like Stanford has Dan Bonnet, which is one of the leading researchers. So I was able to take, you know, classes with his group. And it kind of exposed me to the idea that, you know, you can use, there's a lot of cryptographic primitives which are being developed, which are in the real world actually have like a huge, kind of impact and can solve a lot of the problems which seem unsolvable. Uh, and kind of the problem we tackled with Notebook Labs was how do you combine anonymity and accountability? Um, and and at first glance, this is impossible, right? Like if you're anonymous, how can you be held accountable? Because nobody knows who you are. So it doesn't seem possible, but actually, you know, with like modern cryptography, um, yeah, we, we think we have like a solution to that problem. Yeah, super cool. So, um, you know, what is Notebook Labs? What does it consist of? So basically, Notebook Labs is an infrastructure which allows you to prove, um, to take like off-chain information, which can be verified by like an off-chain party, such as, for example, your date of birth or your country you're from or your credit score or that you, you know, own an asset and then kind of, add it as an on-chain credential, um, it's sort of how like self-sovereign identity works. But in a way where no party knows the link between your wallet and and this like off-chain information. So in kind of in, in current systems, you usually have, it's anonymous except for the party that checks your off-chain information because they issue you like a token or a credential which corresponds to um, like your 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 credential, right? Like the information they checked. And so they know the link between your wallet and your, your personal information, but nobody else knows. Um, and, and, you know, I'm like a big believer of decentralization. So I think that these approaches where you have like a single point of failure don't work. So with Notebook Labs, we, we do the same thing, but we can do it with you no know, zero, um, that you don't trust anyone. So that it, it really does have like full privacy. And then, yeah. You know, this can be used for like KYC. It can be used for credit scoring. Um, it can be used to prove ownership of assets. It can be used as a bridge. Kind of the applications after that are, are sort of endless. Yeah, that's fascinating. So I want to I want to unpack a bunch of what you just said, but maybe maybe to start, could you talk a little bit about how zero knowledge proofs kind of enable some of these applications you're able to create, and maybe a little background on zero knowledge proofs themselves for anyone who's unfamiliar. Yeah, sort of the the analogy, the typical analogy people give to zero knowledge proofs is the the game like Where's Waldo, where you have a book and you have like the little character that you need to find on the book. And let's say, you know, we're playing and you tell me, you know, where he is and I don't know. 
And so like the only way you can tell me is to show me where he is, but then I know, right? So I, I kind of gain knowledge of where's Waldo. Um, and so what you could do is you could like cut out Waldo, then like, you know, throw away the piece of paper and show me the cutout of Waldo. And then I, I have like a guarantee that you knew where he was, but I gained no information um, on, you know, I still don't know where he is if you gave me the like uh, book again, right? And that's kind of the analogy to zero knowledge proofs. You can prove a statement. So usually these statements are converted into like cryptographic primitives, such as like, I know the input to this hash function that gives a certain output, but more generally it can be like, you know, uh, I am like above 18 years old, you know, I like all these features. You can sort of prove these statements without revealing the information. So, yeah, so I can prove to you I'm above 18 and then you know I'm above 18, but you have no idea what my date of birth is, how old I am. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So I want to quote your white paper here quickly where it says, as a team, we believe in decentralization and privacy. Therefore, we've made it our mission to make Web3 safe so that it can, it can become universal. Um, you know, as a side note, I, I really appreciated the candor with which your team described some of the perils of navigating kind of Web3 or crypto over the years where, you know, I feel like it, you don't often see that kind of honest look at the state of play within white papers. So you know, with that said, can you can you maybe talk about that quote a little bit and explain maybe specifically how safety is connected to accountable identity and also how safety connects with sort of universality or, you know, more more widespread adoption of Web3? Yeah, I mean, I, I think first it's it's quite clear right, like that Web3 isn't safe. It has all the hacks um, and kind of how it connects to universality is that just people, a lot of people who aren't like Web3 fans, for example, wouldn't want their, I don't know, wouldn't want to get paid their salary on Web3 because it's so dangerous, right? Like you have so many hacks, yeah. you have, um, there's a lot of stuff that people don't understand. There's a lot of fraud. So our, our kind of approach is that, yeah, the, the, the core principles that, you know, uh, Nakamoto kind of wrote in his Bitcoin paper of like decentralization and privacy are, are very true. And as you know, it's progressed over the years, there's sort of been two approaches. The the first approach is to, you know, retain like this full privacy, full decentralization. But usually this leads to applications which aren't super used um, or are used, but, you know, can't really offer any like huge advantages. Uh, just because it's expensive to have decentralization, like privacy sort of limits what you can do. Um, and then the other approach, which, you know, was taken, uh, yeah, it, it's taken by some chains like, you know, Solana or, or like Arbitrum is to kind of sacrifice on some of these primitives. Like Solana sacrifices on decentralization by only having like four working nodes. But then because of that, they can offer like way cheaper um, gas fees, et cetera. You know, for their users and 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 so our take we're not tackling decentralization we're, we're tackling privacy but our take is like can you build an infrastructure which you, you can keep the privacy but you can add accountability and then when you have accountability you can start making things safe because you can you know punish people who do fraud punish people who do hacks you know punish yeah. malicious users and and if you have this kind of like safety in place you know, people might be more willing to, you know, yeah, like put a larger part of their like financial assets on chain, interact more on chain, all of this. Yeah, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So uh, let's go back to the beginning here where I, I think you're, you know, the project is pretty new, I believe. So I, I guess I'm curious, you know, I typically like to ask, like, what are some of the early challenges been and, and how are you guys solving for those? I think we're talking about kind of right now, like, you know, what are you guys, what are you guys facing with right now? What kinds of challenge, what kinds of challenges? And then how are you guys, how are you guys working on those? Yeah, I think the, the there's kind of two parts. There's the technical aspect and then there's the business aspect. Um, from a technical aspect, it's, it's that the sort of zero knowledge proof environment is really new and you have all these proof systems coming out. Um, but the tooling and kind of the, a lot of the big, like very well-funded companies like Polygon, um, 
So if they build their internal tooling and they sort of don't really release it to to the outside. And so you're stuck with, you know, older tooling, um, bad documentation. So it's very hard to sort of build these, these systems. And yeah, one thing, uh, like we're looking at building like a sort of ZK aggregator for our proofs, like a, a kind of ZK rollup. And it's, it's been tough because there's, you know, you, you either have to build every, you kind of have to build everything yourself, even though the work has already been done by other teams. Um, so that's from a technical perspective, uh, from a business perspective is sort of the market, uh, the go to market. So we, we have like our infrastructure built and now we need to figure out how we're going to like, like what problem we're going to tackle with it. And we have, a, you know, a couple things we're looking at. We're looking at uh, credit scoring and kind of uh, under collateralized lending. Our approach being that, you know, once you have like identity and accountability, you sort of, you can be closer to the web to like traditional finance model. And so you can offer um, under collateralized loans, et cetera. And, you know, another thing we're looking at is KYC, but it's very contingent on regulation change. Um, so, yeah, that, those are kind of the main problems we're, we're working on right now. Yeah, super interesting. So kind of related question, you know, uh, there's challenges, but there's also kind of surprises or opportunities, you know. So what what stood out as the most surprising in your work thus far in building Notebook, whether technical or business? Yeah, I think... What's uh, like one thing which I which surprised me was m- more from a, a business perspective was like pri- the question of privacy. Um, no, I I kind of assumed that everybody cared about privacy, which is naive uh, in retrospect. Like people don't really care, and actually people probably prefer like less private methods if if it's easier to use. Right, like people use. Know Google and not DuckDuckGo on on average, um, and so sort of our infrastructure and the main selling point being privacy, essentially being that if you pay a little bit more fees to use our infrastructure, then you get full privacy, is actually not um, a model which works with most people. And so you kind of have to mm. add something, and you and yeah, as I said, add add account to add KYC, add lending, add. And then target a more niche like use case. I think that was like a yeah, sort of a realization we made. Yeah, that's super interesting. So, you know, kind of in in light of that or jumping off of that, like what is what does the medium term roadmap look like as you guys kind of think about some of those uh further things to work on and build where, you know, you mentioned kind of credit scoring and I read elsewhere. Uh, like cross-chain capabilities or a near-term focus, but I guess I'm curious kind of what further exciting possibilities are on your mind too. Yeah, so firstly, from a, a technical perspective, we're you know, in the next couple of months, we're working a lot to make our, our infrastructure more scalable. Um, so yeah, basically make it much cheaper to use. That That's kind of the first thing. Um, then, you know, we, we're keeping a very close eye on, on regulation right now. And we're exploring how you can sort of add layers of privacy onto existing KYC protocols um, to to basically offer a, a KYC solution that's you know, more suited for Web3. Because obviously, you know, if, like, I don't know, let's say there's a, a regulation and it changes and all of a sudden any DeFi app needs to be KYC, um, then, you know, DeFi kind of dies, right? Like, d- Currently, there's no, there would be no privacy layer. There's no decentralization because these KYC companies can leak. Like if they get hacked, uh, you know, you know everything about all wallet users. It's kind of a, yeah. a really big problem. Um, and so, so yeah, like that's something we're, we're keeping a very close eye on. And then, as you said, we're, we're exploring the, the problem with lending um, and yeah, basically seeing if you can, like uh, when you lend on Aave, you co- you over collateralize uh, your loans with money. Um, but in the real world, that's not what you do. In, in the real world, when you take a loan, you you sort of collateralize with your um, identity, right? Like you say, this is me. And if you default, either in the model of like micro loans, then you kind of have like public shame, um, you know, and like lending within communities and things like right. that. But in the 
but you know with lending like on an institutional level it's more you know people actually know who you are so you can get sued you can get your house um mortgaged etc so we're, we're exploring kind of different ways that you could collateralize your identity uh, to be able to take like under collateralized loans on, on DeFi. Yeah, super interesting. So you guys recently concluded a fundraise in October, kind of during the thick of the bear market, really. So I, I guess I'd love to learn a little bit more about your experience kind of pulling that off and, and how you navigated choosing the right investors who, you know, believed in your work despite overall Web3 investing activity being pretty dramatically down from from even like the prior year. Yeah, I, I think we got very lucky um, with our investors. We were led by Bain Crypto. Uh, they're a really good team. I think they're a very technical team. So they kind of understood like our, our approach of this, like having this really cool technical solution and then seeing where it can be used. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think we got quite lucky. We honestly didn't have too hard a time um, fundraising, but I, I've, I've heard that we were kind of maybe the last like ZK identity company that was, <laughs> that was funded. Um, and then yeah. they sort of stopped funding a ZK identity. Uh, yeah. Got it. Yeah. No, super interesting. So uh, this is kind of just more on a p- personal curiosity, but uh, your team participated in Y Combinator too. And so I, I guess I'm curious, like what's the web three community like in YC? What was that experience like kind of building in that environment? Yeah, I think um, YC are trying to expand to Web3. I The the sort of model of, of YC is that the group partners, like your mentors and your, and your advisors, are ex-founders. Um, and so because there wasn't many, you know, YC, like Web3 YC companies 10 years ago, right. um, it was really only like OpenSea and like a, co- a couple others. It's... Yeah, like the the partners that then, you know, sort of supervised us, who were the Web3 specific partners, don't really have experience building in, in Web3. They're more like Web2 partners that were very interested in Web3. So, I yeah, I think that making an effort to, to add to Web3, I think that in general, YC is very useful because it gives, um, you know, especially us being like a team of students, it gives us like a big stamp of approval, um, the community within YC is very like supportive and, and people try to help each other. But I, I do think they, yeah, they still need to like work on, on kind of helping web three companies because it's a little different to the typical like B2B SaaS that they sort of are, like tailor made for. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So kind of winding down here, but maybe, maybe a couple last questions. Uh, you know, first, maybe just kind of any generalizable advice for founders building in the Web3 space, where if you could go back to the beginning, what would you, you know, what would you tell yourself and your co-founders that would be valuable to potentially to others? Yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of low hanging fruit um, in Web3 because it's such a new space. I also think that, you know, it's, it's definitely worth kind of taking a dive into like the more technically complicated parts of Web3 because actually, you know, it's it's one of the rare fields where research and industry are actually really close to each other. And so there's research that gets published and then a year later, there's like, you know, uh, like a hundred million dollar company whose entire company is just like implementing that research. Um yeah, and so I, I think, you know, whether that be in cryptography and kind of scaling, you know, light clients or all these, you know, different aspects of research um, are really interested. So I think it's it's definitely, yeah, if, if you know, you're someone who's like technically inclined, I think it's definitely interesting to kind of, yeah, kind of take a dive in the deep end and, and try, you know, stay up to date with the, the research being published, you know, the the, like the key players in, involved. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. Okay. So Salal, what is your team working on right now and what is the best way for people to follow along your journey? Yeah. Um, so uh, people should join, you know, on our, on our website, we have a telegram. We're going to launch a discord soon. Uh, we have a mailing list as well. So people should you know, join there. should follow our Twitter, which is notebook labs. Um, 
and then sort of what we're working on. And as I said, we're you know currently sort of really focused on exploring the you know, the, the go to market we're going to choose, whether it be you know lending KYC and all these kind of different applications. So I'd say stay tuned, and we'll have like you know, some like big progress updates in in a few months. Love it. All right, Salah, thank you so much for the time. This is really, really cool stuff. And uh, I'm excited to see how things evolve over the coming months and years. So have a good rest of your week. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye.